Abrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for uh, this Shabbat. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to rest in your presence, that we're able to uh, take this time together as a holy convocation, as a gathering of like-minded people uh, coming together, uh, Jew and Gentile as one new man in the blood of Messiah Yeshua in order to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Lord, I pray that as we prepare to open your word today, that you will speak boldly into our hearts and our lives, that you will speak, uh, Father, that you will shut up every other voice going on all around us, that we can focus intently upon hearing from you, and that we know definitively that this is from you. Lord, I pray that nothing in me will be involved except that which you've ordained specifically for this purpose. And Lord, I ask that you will prepare our hearts even now uh, for what you have uh, in store for us today. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen. Amen. So, uh, as a lot of you are probably aware um, at, by now, um, our life, the, the, the Tokajer family life, is currently uh, in a bit of uh, topsy-turvy um, as we have sold our house that we had in Spanish Fort. We bought a house that's a, um, a tremendous fixer-upper job in Bay Manette, uh, and are currently residing with uh, Danielle and I, the kids, and all three dogs in a camper on property so that we can work on the house uh, for however long this ends up taking for us to get everything done to be able to move in. Um, but uh, what's really interesting about this whole kind of process and journey is that uh, uh, earlier this year, I guess it was probably late last year, uh, Danielle and I both kind of really felt like the Lord was putting it on our hearts to put our house in Spanish Fort up for sale because we had uh, a decent amount of equity built up in it. The market was a bit crazy, uh, and so we'd be able to sell it for more than we bought for it, bought it for. And then our, uh, what we felt the Lord kind of put on our heart was that we were supposed to buy a piece of property for cash uh, so that we'd no longer have a mortgage. Uh, so when the one house uh, sold, we were able to pay for the other house out of the proceeds and have no mortgage left. And uh, so we, we really felt like this was something God put on our heart. We didn't really understand why. It was actually funny uh, because uh, I'm guessing about the same time Danielle and I both felt the Lord put this on our heart, but we didn't really talk to each other about it for a while. Uh, so one day I'm driving down the road. Danielle's in the seat with me. Danny, uh, the kids are in the back. And, and I look over. I was like, so I kind of have this, this thought that maybe we should sell our house uh, and buy a, a fixer up or some property or whatever that, that we can pay cash for and not have a mortgage anymore. What do you think? Or what would you think of that? And Danielle goes, I felt we should do the same thing for weeks now, uh, maybe even a month or so, but I was afraid you were going to think it was stupid, so I just didn't bring it up. And now that you brought it up, it still sounds stupid, but maybe this is really what God wants us to do. And, uh, and so we, we kind of started moving forward on that. We listed the house. We started looking for um, uh, other property, house that we could buy. Um, and we came across the, the house that we ended up buying. And it was kind of funny because we had this appointment scheduled to go look at the house. And uh, we, we knew really nothing about it. It was a, uh, a, an investment firm that does like flips and stuff like that that had bought it. They didn't want to do anything with it. And so they had it up for sale for cheap. And uh, so we went to look at it, or rather I went to look at it because Danielle was supposed to go uh, with me, but she ended up having COVID that week. And uh, like the, I think she tested positive like two days before our scheduled appointment. And so I went ahead and went and I looked at the house and, and went around and Philip took, us, uh, took me to go look at it. And we get there and for whatever reason, we had an appointment set for maybe two o'clock or something like that. For whatever reason, the, the uh, current owners or the, the people that were living there had taken the key out of the lockbox when they left to go uh, wherever they went. They were like an hour and a half away. They had taken the key out the lockbox and left with it. And so we get there and Philip punches his code in. He opens the thing up and there's nothing in the box. Uh, and he's like, uh, I don't know. I don't really know what to do here. This is, I don't, he calls the, the, the other realtor and they go back and forth. And the guy's like, oh yeah, apparently, you know, they were not the brightest about this scenario and they took the key with them. Can you guys come back in like two hours? And if you come back in two hours, you can take a look at it. So we, uh, we decided to look around the outside of the property. We get back in the car as we leave. And we come back about two hours later. It was about 4, 4.30. We get back. We finally get to look around the house. Now, keep in mind, Danielle has not seen this house at all other than like a couple of pictures online and some pictures that I had taken and brought to her. And, uh, and those pictures 
weren't awesome uh, because the house was not awesome. Um, the, the people that lived there were hoarders. They had been there for uh, you know, 40 years. I don't think they ever did really much of anything to the house or at least nothing to completion. Um, and so it was kind of a mess. But uh, Danielle, I, I come home. You know, Again, she's not feeling great. She's sitting at the house uh, trapped in the bedroom uh, by herself on isolation because she's got COVID. And uh, I'm talking to her about the house. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I, I really feel like this is the one. This is the one we're supposed to move on like the price is perfect uh the, we kind of have a rough idea of the amount of work that's going to need to go into it i really feel like this is the house we're supposed to move on we had looked at a few others but uh nothing really panned out and so uh she said look i haven't seen it but if you believe if you feel like this is the right place i'm i'm willing to trust you on it and uh and, and we can put an offer in so i said okay well let's sit on it for the evening we'll pray about it tonight and uh and then we'll we'll put an offer in tomorrow and see what happens so I go over to, uh, to Philip, we're filling out the paperwork to submit the offer. He gets ready to submit it, and he pulls up the listing, and there's nothing there. The listing is completely gone. And he calls the people up, he's like, hey, what's, what's going on? We were getting ready to submit an offer. We just looked at this place yesterday. We would have had it in earlier yesterday, like last night, except your people took the keys so we couldn't get in the house, so it you know, pushed us back a few hours from our expectations. Um, what's going on? And the guy said, oh, well, we literally just took it off the market a few moments ago, because if we had seen it online earlier, like an hour or so before, and then it was gone. Uh, he goes, we, we took it off the market just a few minutes ago because we decided to take it, accept an offer that came in this morning, uh, uh, or late last night, I I think it was no it was it was that morning that came in that morning uh which had we been able to see it when we were supposed to we would have put an offer in that night it would have been an issue but uh they took this offer and they said uh look if you want you can still go ahead and submit an offer and uh and, and if our other one falls back you know we'll consider coming back around or whatever so we prayed about it and we really felt like we were supposed to submit this offer and so we we decided to go ahead and submit the offer as their fallback plan right not ours as their fallback plan uh and we we knew they had several offers so we didn't know how many fallback plans they had to the initial plan before they got to our fallback plan as a fallback plan uh, but we put it in anyways and we just kind of prayed about it and we said okay god if this is if this is where you want us to be if this is the property we're supposed to live on uh then you will make this play out you know, tomorrow morning we'll get a phone call that for whatever reason the offer fell through and if we want it, it's ours and they won't make any changes to uh, any negotiation. They'll take the offer we made and they'll be happy with it and everything will go smooth and, and yada, yada, yada. And, I mean, we were very particular about what all we prayed for it because we said if this is going to happen, you know, we need to see A, B, C, and D play out so that we know without a doubt with confirmation that this was God because this is an entirely psychotic idea we have. And if we're going to do this, we need to know it's God without a doubt. And so we, we submit the offer, uh, and uh, you know, they say, okay, well, if something happens to the other deal, sometimes it does, but it doesn't always. If something happens to the other deal, we'll come back to you. So the next morning, uh, Philip is knocking on our door, and he says, hey, uh, they just called me and said, for whatever reason, the other deal fell through, and they said, if you want it, it's yours. Uh, the asking price, they're good with everything. It's all good. If you want it, it's yours. Uh, we just got to fill out the, the paperwork, accepting their acceptance of the offer, uh, and then we can move forward. And, uh, and so we had prayed, you know, if this is you, God, then this will happen, and this will happen, and this will happen. And if it's not, you will shut down every possible way that this could ever work out so that we never fall into the wrong situation on this. And, uh, and so we get that call. Hey, it's yours. If you want it, it's yours. And they A, B, C, D, everything that was said that we had prayed was, uh, was what happened. Um, and so we made a move on it. And God provided miraculously for us to be able to have the funds to pay for it before we even sold our house. And then we were able to replenish that once we got our house sold. And I mean, it all just kind of fell in place uh, pretty, pretty easily on the purchase of the home. Uh, but it was just one of these really interesting scenarios where you know if this is God, you need to see things happen in a very particular order. So that, because you know, the word says, uh, confirmation, two or three, we wanted to make sure that we had confirmation upon confirmation upon confirmation uh, when we made the move. And so, I don't know if you guys uh, have really ever experienced a situation like this or not in your own lives. I'm sure that all of us in one way or another have. Maybe it was something as simple as driving down the interstate, uh, doing, you know, quote unquote, a little over the speed limit and then spotting a cop in the tree line and knowing uh, for certain that he was going to, to light you up and, uh, and that all of a sudden we're praying, you know, it's funny when we think we're in trouble is when we start praying the hardest, right? And all of a sudden we start praying, you know, God, let, let, let the cop 
top not pull out. Let him not light me up. Let him, you know, whatever happened, just he's having a good day. He's enjoying his donuts, whatever. Just that he doesn't pull out after me. Um, and then we, uh, after we're done praying, realize, you know, the, the, the guy didn't clock us or he didn't chase us down. We never got lit up and things worked out really well. Or maybe we're struggling to pay a bill. And, you know, I've been in this boat uh, over and over again. We're struggling to pay a bill uh, and we're praying for that money to come in. And we pray and pray with clear and concise specifications asking God if this is his will to have it all work out in a very specific way. Then a check comes in the mail uh, for whatever that exact amount is from a situation that we completely forgot about. Or we find a job we feel we would be absolutely perfect for. We put in an application. We go through the interview process. We're waiting to hear word back. And, and we pray for things to pan out in a very specific and particular way. And then later that week, we get a call from the interviewing offer, interviewer offering us the new position. And, uh, and he says everything that we prayed with specification that it would work out and things would happen. Or maybe we're praying for uh, healing for someone in our lives, our friends, our loved ones. We're praying for salvation for our friends and our loved ones. And uh, as we're praying, we're being very specific. Lord, give me divine opportunity to be able to speak into their lives in, in powerful ways with your word as you lead. And we're praying with great uh, anticipation for something phenomenal to happen. Well, this week we read Parsha Chaye Sarah, which literally translates to the life of Sarah, which is Genesis 23, 1 through 25, 18. The only Parsha, this is the only Parsha in the entire Torah to be named after a woman, and none other than the OG matriarch of the Jewish people, Sarah. And the Parsha begins... Oddly, uh, with a given name, uh, the, the name of the Parsha is Chai Sarah, the life of Sarah, but it begins with the death of Sarah, followed by Abraham mourning her death, and then he proceeds to attempt to secure a burial place for her from the sons of Chet, in particular, the cave of Machpelah and the surrounding fields. Uh, he offers to purchase it and goes back and forth with Ephron, the owner, uh, and after Ephron sort of sketchily poses an outlandish price for the property, Abraham immediately accepts and counts out the 400 shekels of silver for what uh, we know uh, now know as the cave of the patriarchs in Hebron. In chapter 24, Abraham sends his servant Eliezer back to Haran to find a bride for Isaac uh, from their own family rather than have him take a bride from the people of Canaan. There's a whole back and forth between Eliezer and uh, Abraham about what if Eliezer is unsuccessful in finding and bringing back a bride for Isaac, should he then bring Isaac back to Haran instead? Uh, to which Abraham very abruptly says with no amb uh, uh, ambiguous opportunity, uh, no, without a doubt, no, he is not to make his way to Haran for any purpose. Make sure he never goes back and that if Eliezer can't find a bride for Isaac and Haran, then he is free of the oath being made. Eliezer then goes to Haran and, and uh, he comes across Rebekah and finds himself success successful in his mission. Laban, her brother, and their mother attempt to delay and ultimately derail her leaving, but eventually uh, they give in and they allow her to choose whether or not she's ready to go immediately. She and Eliezer leave Haran and begin their journey to Canaan, where she ultimately meets Isaac and they become married. And in chapter 25, we read about Abraham taking another wife, Ketorah, who Rashi says is, is possibly Hagar under a different name. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but I like to throw out the, the potential options uh, as a come up, uh, and, and he has more children with uh, Ketorah. Before he dies, he blesses these sons and sends them away to the east so that they can't take from what belongs to Isaac. They can't take from the inheritance that is Isaac's. Ultimately, uh, the Midianites and other enemies of Israel uh, come from these children that are uh, we read are born to Abraham in Genesis 25. Further family conflict uh, is then left behind unintentionally by Abraham uh, as we read that Abraham Abraham takes them and sends these children off to the east with some gifts so that they can't try to step in on Isaac's inheritance. Um, and some of those people that he sends off to the, the east become some of the problems and the thorns in Israel's side as they finally make their way into the promised land. Then we read of Abraham's death, Isaac and Ishmael burying him in the cave of Machpelah with Sarah and the genealogies of the 12 sons of Ishmael. And lastly, we read of Ishmael's death. But I want us to focus on one particular area of Parsha Chayisera uh, in Genesis 24. From this narrative, we learn a key principle of prayer that I know has changed my prayer life and I hope will deepen yours as well. And that principle is this. Pray in faith 
with specificity, uh, praying in faith with specificity makes room for God to show his might and power in amazing ways. One more time, praying in faith with specificity makes room for God to show his might and power in amazing ways. So let's dig into the word together uh, this morning. In Genesis chapter 24, as we mentioned a few moments ago, Abraham sends his servant Eliezer to find a wife for Isaac. But Abraham's very specific about how this should be done. He doesn't want Isaac to marry a woman from Canaan, if at all possible. So he tells Eliezer to go back to Haran, to his own family's town, and to look for a bride there. And he sends him with many gifts to bless both the potential bride and her family, should he be successful. He makes a point to tell Eliezer that under no circumstances is Isaac to leave the promised land to go back to Haran, even if he is unsuccessful. If this occurs, then Eliezer is off the hook for the oath he is entering with Abraham. So Eliezer gathers uh, up everything Abraham is prepared to send to Haran, and he heads off on his way. He finally arrives in uh, Aram Naharaim, the city in which Nahor, Abraham's brother, resides. Uh, he finds a place to settle in just outside the city at a well uh, that everyone would use to draw water, and he waits for God's move next. Genesis 24, verse 12 says, Adonai, the God of Abraham, my master, he said, please make something happen before me today and show loyalty to Abraham, my master. Look, I am standing by the spring of water. The daughters of the men of the city are going out to draw water. Now, let it be that the young woman who I say, please tip your jar so that I may drink, and she said, will say, drink, and I'll also water your camels. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. So by this, I will know that you have shown graciousness to my master. Notice how specific Eliezer is in his prayer. He has served Abraham faithfully for many years now and has witnessed many miracles and acts of faithfulness of Hashem to Abraham all along. He was there when God called Abraham to pack up and leave his family and head to the promised land, and he went with him. He was there when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. He was there through the quarreling over the wells with Abimelech's people and uh, the miraculous provision of the well at Beersheba. He was there when Isaac was born. He was uh, uh, there uh, uh, when Abraham came back from the mountain with Isaac after the Akedah, after the binding of Isaac. He witnessed Adonai pro prosper and bless Abraham over and over and over again all the way along their journey. So Eliezer knew without a doubt that Adonai is a personal God who sees our hearts, hears our cries, and he answers our prayers. And he knows that without the help of God, he cannot even remotely be successful in finding a beshert or the, the, the soulmate of Isaac for, uh, and fulfilling the mission that Abraham has sent him on. So before uh, his search begins, he finds a good place to rest and he goes before the Lord in prayer. How many of us could learn a lesson just from that? Right? Before we set out to do whatever the next task is, let's just kind of sit back for a minute and let's pray. And let's ask the Lord to speak into this situation and, and to lead and to guide this situation. Uh, so he sits down at the well. He finds a good spot to, to kick back and rest, and he prays. But he doesn't just pray randomly. He doesn't cry out to God with kind of this Hail Mary style of a prayer, right? He doesn't say, God of my master Abraham, please help me find a wife for Isaac. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, he doesn't say, God of Abraham, show me the right chick. Right? He doesn't, it's not very blanket. It's not very basic. It's not just a one-liner. He's not just, you know, I'm going to say this, and if something happens, great. And if not, whatever. I don't really care anyways. Right? This is, a, by the way, the same guy, Eliezer. He's the same servant that when Abraham was having this argument with God about Ishmael versus Isaac, and, and before Isaac was born, uh, even before Ishmael was born, he was like, you know, God, you keep telling me that you've got all this promise and blessing that you set before me, that this land is going to be an eternal inheritance for my children, but... I don't have that kid yet. Like, uh, you keep saying it's going to be through the seed of, of me and Sarah, but we don't have a kid yet. How's this going to play out? I'm not really seeing how these pieces are going to come together to make a nice little puzzle here, God. Right? He has this disagreement back and forth with God, and he says, you know, you, you're making all these promises to me, and that's all fine and wonderful, but it's going to end up being my house servant, Eliezer, who's been with me the longest. It's going to be the one that gets all the inheritance instead of a son of promise as you've spoken of. This is that same Eliezer, who at one point was the only dude in line for the inheritance that is now Isaac's, and his master, Abraham, has now sent him to go find a wife for Isaac who would help produce progeny so that the inheritance could continue to go on through that seed of promise instead of through Eliezer's hands. 
right? That's a lot of dedication to your boss. That's a lot of dedication to your master that you're willing. You know, Eliezer could have, you know, if I just don't go find her a bride, him a bride, if I don't put my full effort into this, maybe he doesn't have kids, and maybe all of that stuff falls back in my lap or the lap of my children. Instead, maybe this could all work out, right? He doesn't appear to ever have this thought. Um, instead, he prays, and he's extremely specific about it. He wants to know without a shadow of a doubt that God has answered his prayer and that he has found the, the right girl, the Beshert, the, 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 the uh, soulmate for Isaac without any room for confusion. He wanted to know for a fact that when he went back to his master Abraham with this woman who would be the wife of Isaac, that he knew without a doubt this was the woman that God has chosen. This was the divine appointment for Isaac and there would be zero doubt in his mind. So Genesis 24, verse 14. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, this is Eliezer speaking, please tip your jar so that I may drink. And she will say, drink, and I'll also water your camels. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. So by this, I'll know that you have shown graciousness to my master. Notice that his prayer focuses in on the hospitality of the girl he's looking for. I'll ask for a little water for myself, and uh, should she give me a water to drink and also say that she's going to water my camels without asking, I'll know without a doubt that she is the one that you have appointed in faithfulness for Abraham's son Isaac. Notice the specificity of prayer, but why this specific sign? Because he was looking at the heart of the girl. If her heart was one of hospitality, then she would be an ideal mate for Isaac because he has always witnessed the hospitality of Abraham's heart and knows it is a gift from God. Particularly, remember last week's Parsha when God appears to Abraham and promises a son a year later and also tells him of the coming destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Abraham washes their feet and offers them a little bread uh, to help sustain them on their journey. And when they agree to sit and to eat, instead of bringing just a few morsels of bread as he described it, he rushes off to his uh, wife and he says, take the finest of flour and make uh, bread. And then he rushes off to his herds and he picks, hand selects, hand selects, uh, a, a uh, ox to, to feed um, and, and tells his, his people, look, I need you to go ahead and, and prep this and butcher it and get ready to go and cook it. You're not butchering an animal that big in a rapid way, right? This, this isn't going to be a, a, you know, pop it in the oven for 30 seconds and it's okay type of a scenario. Like, this is going to take time. They've got to slaughter this animal. They've got to break the cuts of meat down. They've got to cook the cuts of meat that are going to be served. She's making fresh dough from scratch and piecing it all together. She's got to let it rise and, and then uh, knead it. She's got to let it rise again and knead it. She's got to put it in the oven and wait for it to bake. She's got to go through this whole process that's going to take time. And yet Abraham was still beyond hospitable about it. Abraham said, I'll bring you a little food and instead brings a feast of honor for these people that came from God, for, for who is uh, God and his messengers coming to him, lays this fantastic feast before them. Eliezer knew if the girl's hospitality even remotely rivaled that of Abraham, she would be the perfect match for Isaac. So he prays very specifically to see God work in a very tangible and miraculous way before his eyes. Again, our principle, praying in faith with specificity makes room for God to show his might and power in amazing ways. Now, remember, camels can go for a very long period of time without drinking any water because their natural habitat is the dry and ridiculously hot desert. As such, when they do drink water, they drink a lot of water. And I'm not talking like, you know, me coming inside on a hot day after cutting the grass and grabbing a glass or two of water and just downing it real quick, right? We're not talking a lot of water in our perspective. No, camels drink a lot of water. In fact, uh, a single camel can drink anywhere from 30 to 50 gallons of water in as little as three minutes. And Eliezer had 10 camels with him. So on a low estimate at 30 gallons each, that's about 300 gallons of water that this girl is going to draw from the well by herself, plus the water that she draws for Eliezer and for her own needs. Because remember, she's going to the well for a reason already, right? And so uh, she's going to offer to draw 300 to 500 gallons of water to, to water the camels and get them satisfied and draw water for Eliezer and draw water for her own needs and whatever it was she had going on. You really can't get much more specific than that. God, if this is the right chick, then when I ask her for a sip of water, she's going to say, well, I'll draw you a couple hundred gallons. Why not? I got nothing better to do with my life. This will be a great way to use time, right? 
very particular, very specific. And Eliezer isn't playing games. He wants to be successful in order to honor Abraham, who has always been good to him. He wants to make sure that, that this assignment is completed perfect, uh, perfectly. And I think he also wants to honor God in what he's doing. So when, a, uh, when he prays, he doesn't mess around. And then we read verse 15 of Genesis 24. Now, before he had finished speaking, behold, there was Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, going out with her, with her jar on her shoulder. Now, the young woman was very good looking, a girl of marriageable age, and she was a virgin. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me sip a little water from your jar. So she turns to him. She says, drink, my Lord. And she quickly lowers the jar into, onto her hands and gave him a drink. Right? Okay. Lord, I'm asking for A, B, and C. So I know without a doubt that this is your will and what you're doing. Okay, can I have a sip of water? Okay, she lowers it down and immediately pours and gives him some water. Okay, A is complete. That she'll offer me a little water. Right? Now, when she finished giving him a drink, she said... I'll also draw water for your camels until they finish drinking. Now we've got B. She says, I'll also draw water for your camels as well. So she quickly poured out her jug into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew water for all his camels, while the man continued to pay close attention to her, keeping silent in order to know whether or not Adonai had made his way successful. He was watching. He was waiting. He wanted to make sure that A, B, and C occur. And he's watching patiently. Now, how many of us, as I said earlier, when uh, we're getting ready to do something, we could really afford to take a quick minute to pray over it first? How many of us, uh, more often than not, will skip over the opportunity to pray for whatever we're doing? Even the simplest things, we'll skip over the opportunity to pray for it. And then when it comes time for us, you know, we're waiting for God to do something. We want to see God do something. It comes time for us to, to watch what God's going to do. But we don't really know what to watch for because we didn't give him the time of day to begin with to understand what's going to happen next and what we're looking for, right? Before Eliezer was finished praying, before his prayer was even out of his mouth completely, God was already answering and God was showing out in the finest of details to everything that Eliezer requested. Up walks Rebecca, who's a prime candidate. He asks her for a little water, and she quickly and joyfully draws water for him and gives him a drink. Then without missing a beat, she turns and she draws water for the camels too. Remember, 300 to 500 gallons to satisfy the camels. But God shows out a little more here too because even as specific as Eliezer was in his prayer, he only asked that the girl be willing to draw water for the camels. But Rebecca goes beyond that and, uh, and says that she will not only draw water for the camels but continue to do so until they have finished drinking. This is why that 30 to 50 gallons per camel, 300 to 500 gallons drawn is so important because she didn't say, I'll just pour enough water that they can slap up a few sips and be okay. She says, I will pour enough until they are finished drinking. All that Eliezer said was that she'd be willing to water the camels too. And God turns around and says, ah, not only is she willing, but she's going to continue to draw water until they are satisfied, until they have had their fill. And as she draws the water, Eliezer patiently and calmly pays close attention to be absolutely certain that God has in fact answered his prayer here. And as soon as she's done, he gives her a nose ring and bracelet, signs of betrothal or engagement in the ancient Near East, knowing exactly nothing about her. Literally zero. Knew nothing about her at all. Besides the fact that God has, without a doubt, answered his prayer and made his mission successful. And then when Eliezer is uh, praising God for uh, answering his prayers, we read this in verse 26, Genesis 24, verse 26. Then the man bowed down and worshipped uh, Adonai, and he said, Blessed be Adonai, the God of my master, Abraham, who was not forsaken his loyalty and his truth toward my master. As for me, uh, Adonai has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brother. Now, I want to talk for a second. Don't go off of that. I want to talk for just a second. You'll see it, it says, uh, who has not forsaken his loyalty and his truth toward my master. In the Hebrew, the root words there are chesed ve'emet, 
right? Chesed is uh, often translated, here we see it translated as loyalty. It's awfully translated as loving kindness. My Israeli friends will swear up and down that the most accurate translation of chesed is mercy, right? So in his loving kindness or his mercy and his vehemet, he is uh, he's truth, he's ha'emet, he's the truth. It says, so you have been faithful to my master in chesed vehemet and mercy and in truth and loyalty and in truth and loving kindness and in truth. But I want you to understand something. One of the things that I believe Eliezer is recognizing here, and this is something that Rabbi Toby mentioned in Bible study on Tuesday night, is that God is faithful, he's merciful, he is chesed vehemet, he is merciful and, and truth. No matter what we do, he stays consistent. He's constant. He is always faithful, he is always loyal, he is always merciful, and he is always truth. He will always be chesed vehemet, no matter what you or I do or don't do, no matter how well we follow his will or don't, no matter how closely we are walking in righteous faithfulness to him or not, he will always be chesed vehemet. And we see that with Abraham's life, right? God was always chesed vehemet with Abraham, but Abraham was always a train wreck. Right? We read not once but twice that Abraham tries to pass off Sarah as his sister so that he can save his own hide and really could care less about what happens to her. That's a pretty dirtbag move right there, if you ask me. Right? <laughs> Sarah comes to him and says, hey, I have this great idea. I haven't been able to give you a kid, but, but here's my thoughts. Hear me out and tell me what you think. Uh, I'm going to hand you Hagar, my servant. You can, have, uh, you can marry her, and she'll give you a son, and, and, and that can be your son of promise. And Abraham doesn't go... Let me go take a minute, and remember we said, right? Stop for a minute before we move forward and pray. Let me go take a minute and pray real quick. Let me see how, this, uh, how the Lord's going to play. Now, Abraham's like, every other stupid dude in the world. It's like, all right, cool, let's go do this, right? Abraham should have had the common sense enough to go, there's no way this plays out well. There's zero way this plays out well, right? Any honest husband will say, look, I can barely keep one, I can barely pretend like I'm putting the effort into keeping one wife happy. Notice how I changed it, because I don't want it to be that the wife's getting blamed, all right? Listen to me. If we're not keeping our wife happy, it's typically because we're being idiots, all right? I'm just going to put that out there, and I'm willing to take the blame for being an idiot. That's also not to take all the weight off of the women either, but nonetheless, in this case, I'm dealing with the husband. Odds are, if we're not keeping our wife happy, it's because we're being idiots. But Abraham was an idiot. Abraham, Abraham was like the epitome of an idiot in this case. Uh, Abraham should have went, you know, that's probably never going to end well. I can't see, you know, I've done the math real quick, I've, I've called the actuaries to find out, and, and none of these numbers are going to play out the way they should. Um, let's just, let's, let's maybe not do that, because, you know, I brought Lot along thinking he could maybe serve as that inheritor. Uh, that didn't quite work out well, that blew up in my face, and, and I don't think this is going to work out so well either. No, Abraham tags along with the idea, right? So even in Abraham's dumbest moments, the Lord is still chesed vehemet. He is still faithful. He is still merciful. He is still loving kindness and truth. And I want you to, to walk away today with some encouragement in that because the reality is, is odds are at least once this past week, more likely probably multiple times each day this past week, we have all had moments of severe stupidity in our walk with the Lord, right? Without a doubt, we have all had moments of stupidity in our walk with the Lord this week. And despite your failure, he's still faithful. He is still chesed vehement. Despite your not necessarily walking in perfect lockstep with him every single moment of your week this past week, he is still chesed vehement in your life, just as Eliezer knew and had witnessed that he was chesed vehement in Abraham's life. No matter what, no matter where they were, no matter what was going on, no matter what enemies or stupidity or mistakes Abraham faced, Eliezer witnessed chesed vehement of Adonai faithfully all the time. So aside from praying in the name of Yeshua, specificity in our prayers is one of the most powerful resources we have available to us in our discipleship. A few practical examples of what I'm talking about uh, in terms of specificity, and, and I, I'm going to throw this out real quick before I dive into these examples, is I'm not talking about prayer at this moment, just how important specificity is in our wording, all right? Uh, so if I go to Danielle, Danielle loves beef and anchovy uh, on a pizza. Like her, one of her favorite things is a pizza with beef and anchovy. It's absolutely disgusting. She would literally be the only one in our household where they would eat it, but she loves it. If I go to her and I'm wanting a veggie pizza and I'm working on something, I say, hey, baby, would you do me a favor? Would you just order a pizza real quick? 
right? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I got this, I got this. An hour or so later, she comes back and was like, hey, pizza just got here, let's go eat. And I walk in and open that pizza box up, and there's a beef and anchovy pizza sitting there when I wanted a veggie pizza. I can't get mad at her, right? I can't get mad at her because I wasn't specific. I asked her to order a pizza, she ordered a pizza, right? I can't get mad at her, that one's on me, right? If I wanted her to order a veggie pizza, the way I should have asked it would be, hey, would you order us a veggie pizza? And then if she ordered a beef and anchovy pizza instead of a veggie pizza, then we got a conversation to have, and that's an uncomfortable thing. But if all I do is say, hey, would you order a pizza? And she orders a pizza. She did what was asked. Uh, and if we're honest about it, odds are I deserved the sarcastic payback anyways. Um, <laughs> You know, I joke with her all the time. We've been married for 21 years. We've been together for almost 25, and, uh, and I joke with her all the time and say, look, if you, just, if you just say the right things when you're asking a question, use the right sequence of words, our conversations will get where you want it to go way faster, right? So we're driving around, and she goes, hey, do you want to go to TJ Maxx? <laughs> no, <laughs> not even a little bit. I have zero desire to go to TJ Maxx. Well, I want to go. Okay, well, sounds like a personal problem. You should have said, hey, I want to go to TJ Maxx. Will you take me? That's a whole different conversation, and that's going to be way more productive for you. You've now asked if I want to go. No, I don't want to go. We're not going to TJ Maxx because you put it in my hands. Just like I, if I said order a pizza and get a beef and anchovy, that's on me, right? One of my favorite stories of my great-grandparents uh, was that one day my great-grandmother walked into the living room and asked my great-grandfather if he would like some coffee or hot tea. We Jewish people are very, very good at sarcasm. First language is always sarcasm. Um, and his response was simply, yes. <laughs> Would you like coffee or tea? Yes. Well, his response was sarcastic. And a few moments later, her response was perhaps one step better in sarcasm. So a few moments later, she walks in and hands him a nice piping hot cup of warm liquid. And he goes to take that first sip and immediately realizes it is either absolutely terrible tea or absolutely terrible coffee. <laughs> Come to find out she had filled the cup half with tea and half with coffee. Seeing as she asked a specific question and he gave a very vague answer and he learned a very valuable lesson on specificity. Praying in faith whether, uh, with specificity, again this principle, praying in faith with specificity makes room for God to show his might and power in amazing ways in our midst. In Matthew 20, we read again, uh, uh, or we see again the power of specificity in our request of God. Matthew 20, verse 29 says, Now, as they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Here, two blind men sitting by the roadside, when they heard that Yeshua had, was passing by, they cried out, saying, Have, you, have mercy on us, O Master, Ben David, son of David. The crowd warned them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Master, Ben David. Yeshua stopped and called out to them, What do you want me to do for you? He said. And they said to him, Master, let our eyes be opened. Moved with compassion, Yeshua touched their eyes. Instantly they regained their sight, and they followed him. Now, we're talking about Yeshua, God in flesh. Did he really have to ask, what do you want me to do for you? Or did he likely already know exactly what they wanted? Think about it. This is 20 chapters deep in a Matthew's narrative of Yeshua's life and of his ministry. He's performed many miracles up to this point. Here sits two blind men crying out, have mercy on us, Ben David. If Yeshua had handed them a tuna salad sandwich, wouldn't it have been merciful? They're beggars in the street. If he handed them a tuna salad sandwich, wouldn't it have been merciful? Had he dropped a few coins in their styrofoam cups, wouldn't it have been merciful? Had he given them a really good hug and a gift card, wouldn't it have been merciful? But rather than just being sarcastic like I probably would be, Yeshua asks them, what do you want me to do for you? Kind of like he asks Solomon when Solomon becomes king. What do you want me to do for you? What can I give you? And Solomon's response immediately, give me the wisdom needed to lead your people. And God says, see, because of the prayer that you asked, which was specific, and it wasn't about you, and it wasn't about riches and wealth and prosperity and all these other things, I'm going to give you exactly what you asked for specifically because you asked for it for the betterment of my people, but I'm also going to give you all of the things you didn't ask for with it as well. Yeshua asks, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I'd likely argue perhaps... A little bit of sarcasm may have been in his response, as I'm pretty confident he knew really well what they were wanting. 
But I think that, that what he was really trying to do was to see if these two men sitting here as beggars, as blind beggars on the roadside, actually even knew what it was they really wanted most. Master, let our eyes be open is their response. They don't say, Master, give us sight. Master, heal our eyes. Master, show us the world around us. No, very intentionally, the wording is, Master, let our eyes be opened. And the very specific words, I believe, tells us a lot about them as well. They weren't just looking for sight, physical, tangible sight, which they did miraculously get. But I think that they were looking to see the works of Messiah as well. Because Yeshua touched their eyes, instantly they regained their sight, and what did they do? They immediately became Tamudim, disciples, followers of Yeshua. Why? Because as we see with Yochanan Hamadil's disciples coming to Yeshua, Yeshua to find out who he is, this was one of the, the, the things that Israel was to keep an eye out for as a sign of the Messiah, was the eyes of the blind being opened. Luke chapter 7, verse 18, John is sending his disciples to Yeshua. John's disciples reported to him about all these things, calling two of his disciples. John sent them to the Lord saying, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? When they appeared before him, the men said, John the Immerser sent us to you saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? At this very hour, he was healing many with, the, with diseases and sicknesses and evil spirits. And he granted sight to many who were blind. And answering, he said to them, Go, report to John what you saw and heard. Here's what you're to report. The blind see, the lame walk, those with Zarat are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. And the poor have good news proclaimed to them. Blessed is he who is not led to stumble because of me. Yeshua knew exactly what these blind men begging on the street side, uh, what they wanted. Long before they ever opened their mouth the first time, crying out, uh, Master, uh, our Master, Ben David. Before they ever said, we want to have our eyes opened. No, he knew without a doubt exactly what they needed, but he didn't work a miracle for them until they were specific in what they wanted to see. Master, let our eyes be opened. Again, our principle, praying in faith with specificity makes room for God to show his might and power in amazing ways. This doesn't mean God can't or won't answer a vague prayer. But there's something to uh, the idea of faith required for a very specific prayer that opens up doors that maybe we never could have thought to look for. If we simply pray, God, I have bills that need to be paid, please provide some money. It isn't showing quite the same depth of faith as, God, I have a $213.73 power bill due on Monday, and I only have $27.28 to my name at the moment. Please work a miracle and provide the $213.73 needed so that my family doesn't go without power this month. Then we get home, and there's a random check for that exact amount sitting in our mailbox. Our prayers of specificity allows for God to show up and show off in big ways. And I've seen it happen time and time again in my own life. You've heard me talk about how when Danielle and I were in Georgia, we had a, uh, a bill due. Uh, and I can't remember exactly what the bill was. We had a bill due. It was several hundred dollars. We did not have that money. Like, it wasn't in our budget. Our money for the month was used. It was gone. It was done for. There was no hope. There was no way we were paying this bill, and it had to be paid. If it wasn't paid, we were in some deep trouble with this, right? And I don't remember if it was like something with service was going to be cut off or what have you, but either way, we had this big bill that was due, and if our worship team will make their way up, and, and we went to synagogue on a Saturday morning. We're praying, like, this has to be paid Monday. We don't know how we're going to pay it. God, please make this happen. Here's what the bill is. Here's how much it is. We know that you are faithful, that you are chesed vehement, that you are, are, are merciful and you are truth. And your word says anything we ask in Yeshua's name will be given. So Lord, we are asking for this exact dollar and cent amount miraculously to be put in our hands so that we can pay this bill. And we trust in perfect faith that you will answer us because of your love, because of your mercy, because of your faithfulness, because of the fact that you are truth. And so we pray and we pray and, and we get done with service that day. We go home and we go to our mailbox and open up the mailbox. We live in an apartment complex and you got the big banks of mailboxes. You go and put your key in and we take our mail out and we lock it back up and we're heading back to the apartment and we're shuffling through the mail. Uh, and as we do, we come across this really interesting envelope. What in the world is this? I don't know what this, well, hang on a sec. Here, hold this for a second. I'm gonna open it up. I open it up and we start to read it. And it's a letter. As we open it up, there's a letter and there's a check in it. 
We're reading the letter, and the letter in New York, where I went to college at, where Danielle went to college in New York, uh, the state of New York requires for colleges and universities to provide a secondary uh, health insurance for their students, so that if for whatever reason something happens, that student doesn't have insurance, then they're covered still, and if they do have insurance, and their insurance doesn't pay enough, there's a secondary insurance that will cover it, and none of these students with this, you know, heavy student loan debt would then end up with a bunch of medical bills afterwards, and what have you, um, so in New York, they require uh, for these schools to provide insurance. And by provide, I mean they tack it onto your bill, so you're still paying for it. It's just the school makes sure you has it, have it. Um, and so uh, we're in Georgia at this point. We're long out of college. We're in Georgia. And we get this letter, and it says that there was some sort of a class action lawsuit against the insurance provider that our school used because they were overcharging for everybody's uh, premiums. And it was a check for reimbursement from the court case from this class action lawsuit that we knew nothing about. It was a reimbursement for the, 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 the extra fees and, and charges that we had gotten charged on our student account while we were in, in New York. And it came from the law firm that fought the case and all this. We knew nothing about it. We didn't even know that this class action lawsuit was going on, and we had no clue that we were included in it and when we open it up and we look at the check the check was for the exact dollar amount for the bill that we had due on Monday and the Lord miraculously provided it from a resource that we had no clue even remotely existed we knew nothing about it so what are you praying for right now what are you praying for are you being vague in your prayers or are you being specific are you showing your trust and faith in the hand of God the miraculous hand of God through your faith by being specific or are you being vague and throwing Hail Marys what takes more faith and allows more room for God to move is asking God for a specific miracle uh, and just throwing out a Hail Mary about it or going into detail and asking God. Not that God needs to know about, you know, the, the mole that I've got on my back and the, the, the pot. I don't really have. I'm just using an example. <laughs> thought about how that sounded for a second. But, you know, the mole that I've got on my back and the possible diagnosis that it could be from the, the, uh, the, the doctors and, uh, and yada, yada. Like, God doesn't need me to tell him all of this because he's already aware. But there's something about going to God and saying, hey, you know this mole's on my back. You're well aware of what the doctor's saying this could be. And Lord, I am crying out for you miraculously right now to have it be completely healed and gone. We have the opportunity to lay out the specificity and what we're asking the Lord for. And I promise you, there is far greater faith in putting our hopes in the confirmation of the answer of our prayers from a God who is chesed ve'emet, who is faithful and true than it is to just throw a Hail Mary out there and hope for the best. What miracles are you praying for right now? Is it the finances of your family? Is it healing in your own life or the life of someone you know? Is it your children's salvation, your parents' salvation, your friend's salvation? Is it a better job? Are you being specific in your prayers or are you just throwing out Hail Marys? Praying in faith with specificity again makes room for God to show his might and power in amazing ways. Now, don't get me wrong. God isn't a short order cook, but he does love to do the miraculous in our lives. And when we pray with specificity, we allow for that very reality to occur in very big ways in our lives. And we're, are we matching the faith of Eliezer in our prayers? God, I will know without a doubt that you have made my journey a success. If when I ask the girl for water, she gives me some and then also provides 300 gallons of water for my camels. That is specific. Have mercy on us, Ben David. What do you want me to do for you? Open my eyes. Don't just give me sight. Open my eyes that I may see you. That's specific. Father, make yourself known tangibly to my children today. Restore them in faithfulness to you through faith in Messiah Yeshua. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Soften their hearts to the truth of your salvation. That is specific. We've got to stop throwing Hail Mary prayers and expecting powerful results. This doesn't mean God can't move even in our vagueness, but where's our faith and what God can do when we are vague and what we ask for? If we believe, then we should trust in the specificity as we pray. God does love you. He is faithful. He is merciful. He is chesed ve'emet. He is merciful and true. And his promises are ever so true in your life today as they always have throughout the history of his creation. 
Trust in him. Trust in his promise. Trust in his faithfulness. Trust in his work. Trust in his hand in your life. Trust that if, if he's calling you to do something, he's given you that confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. If you're seeking him out for a change in your walk, in your life, and he's given you confirmation after confirmation after confirmation, don't pull a Gideon. All right? We talk about Gideon and throwing the fleece out like it's a good thing. It wasn't. All right? It wasn't. God was still faithful, even though Gideon was making a dumb mistake. God said, do this. And Gideon says, okay, I hear you, God, but just in case I'm not really hearing you, also I really don't want to do this, so I'm hoping I'm not hearing you. Uh, I'm going to throw this out, and, and if in the morning there's dew on it and not, or dew on the ground and not on it, I'll know that you did something, that this is what you want me to do. I will believe in the confirmation. The next morning, Gideon walks out, and, and I can kind of picture myself in his shoes, his, his shoes as he walks out, and he's like, Please don't be dry. Please don't be dry. Please don't be dry. Ah, oh, crap. It's dry. Okay, God, I see it. I see it. I know you. I was specific and you answered it. I'll tell you what, God, let's give this one more shot. One more shot. I'm going to put it out again. And if in the morning the ground around it is dry and it's wet, then I'll know that this was you, right? He already said, if this happens, I'll know it's you. He doesn't want that. He's not happy with that answer. Does it again. Well, guess what? God does it again. Exactly as he said, everything. And I picture Gideon walking out going, please be dry, please be dry. Oh, it's wet. What a, I don't want to do this, but I guess I got it, right? I guess I have to do this. We're not asking, I'm not telling you to be specific out of doubt or out of not wanting to do something. I'm asking to be specific because you are a person who believes in perfect faith that anything we ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach can and will be given to us. That God's desire is to bless us in our lives so that he can use our testimony to bless the lives of others. What kind of a testimony does Eliezer now have? This great man of faith that we don't even look at as our, one of our patriarchs, but he was a part of that whole scenario with our patriarchs. What kind of a testimony does he now have that he served his master, master faithfully over and over and over again? And when he went to find a bride for his master's son, as he said, he was very intentional in being faithful to the God of Abraham anyways. Even though it may not have necessarily been his God yet, he was being faithful in it. What kind of a testimony does he have now? The blind men, right? God, uh, we you know, want some coins. We want this. Well, no, no. I want my eyes opened. Why? So that they could see him. And he was faithful not only to open their eyes, but that when they opened their eyes, they did in fact see him. They recognized what John the Immerser, Yochanan Hamabil, John the Baptist recognized when his disciples came back and said, the eyes of the blind are open, the deaf are hearing, the lame uh, are walking, he's raising people from the dead, uh, the people's tongues are coming alive, they're able to speak when they never were. He went back and they told him these things and John immediately knew this is the Mashiach. Why? Because everything that he was doing were signs of the coming Mashiach. And the blind men opened their eyes and they saw Yeshua. And they instantly believed and followed him as disciples. We always talk about the 12 disciples like they were the only dudes that were with them. There was the 12, there was the 70, and there were hordes of thousands that followed him around the Galilee and even down into Jerusalem. There wasn't just the 12 disciples. There were hordes and hordes of disciples following him. And these blind men opened their eyes and they recognized the truth of their salvation stood right before them. And they believed in him and followed him as his disciples. He gave them their sight to see and gave them their sight to see spiritually. Avrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for your holy Shabbat. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness and that your word is true. No matter what, no matter where we are in our walk in our lives, we thank you that your word is true. Lord, I pray right now that every prayer that you have placed upon our heart, every desire that you've placed upon our heart, every calling that you've placed upon our heart, Lord, as we lay them before you right now, that we lay them before you with specificity for you to move in specific ways that we can see your hand at work in a mighty and powerful way in our lives. And Father, I pray that you'll breathe new life into our midst today as we prepare to encounter the world around us with the good news of Messiah Yeshua. Make your truth ring true in our thoughts, our lives, our actions long before we ever open our mouth to speak your word. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray and everyone says, Amen.